Okay, we're back. And what we're going to do now is continue with chapter one. Let me take a drink. This will be chapter one B. And I will label them one C, D, etc. until we finish the first chapter. And then when I do chapter two, or this is really chapter 10 that we're starting with, um, then it will be the chapter, and again, I'll do A, B, and C, okay? One thing that I want to ask for you to do is, let me find my folder. Oh, I think maybe in here. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you to um, write a uh, write a couple things for me. I can't find it exactly. Um, I had it written down and I had it, and now I can't find it. But I think I can remember. Um, I want you to answer two questions for me. I want you to answer the question, uh, what is language? What is it? And what the second question would be, what does it do for us? I had my face-to-face -face class do that. Interesting to read those. and. It kind of gives me a little insight as to what you think about language, uh, how you perceive it, how you think it works for us. So I would like for you to answer those two questions. What is language? What do you think it is? And then I also, within that, I want you to write, how do you think children learn language? How do you think children learn language? What is it? And what does it do for us? So maybe that's a three-parter. How do children learn language? What is it? What does it do for us? What is it? Okay. And I want you to email that to me. I do have a box account now. I haven't checked that out to make sure that it works. Um, so you can either try and use the box account 270 or you can email me those responses and I would like those responses by Friday. Now, you get points by turning your assignments in on time. So keep that in mind. That's how you're gonna get some points. I've asked everybody to do this. Okay, so how do children learn language? What's it gonna do for us? What is it? And get that to me. Okay, I have reviewed the syllabus and we started with chapter 10 and chapter 10 again is, again is the anatomy and the physiology and how that impacts our ability to speak and use language and to hear. We talked about the four processes for speech and those four processes will be on the first exam questions about that and as you see in the PowerPoint, we're talking about respiration, the breathing. We're talking about phonation, which is the noise that is made. We're talking about resonation, and that's the tone of the noise from the vocal folds, and uh, based on the size and the shape of the resonating cavities and we're talking about articulation. Now, we know that those four processes are really vital, important for speech, but they have other more important purposes about them. And what we talk about with um, the breathing is it's more important for us to breathe because it's the primary reason that a person uh, it can absorb oxygen into the bloodstream. We know that. We know that the larynx right in here is known as the voice box, and it's 
the valve in your throat that prevents foreign substances from going down the wrong place. And the tongue is used to produce speech sounds. T -t -d -d -d. But we also know it's more important, importantly the structure that we use for eating. So these structures are important for speaking, but they had more important jobs as to help sustain us. Now, as we talk about speech, it's interactions of these four processes <coughs> that generate speech or produces speech. And it happens very quickly. You don't think about it. There are precise movements. It's very synchronized and it happens just like that, and you don't even think about it. Everything that we use to speak is controlled by the brain. It is really, really our computer. It is controlled by the brain. If you want to refer to those four processes in your textbook, uh, according to the PowerPoint, it's on page 395, figure 10-1. So with breathing, or respiration, we're going to talk about inhalation and exhalation. You take breath in, and then you release that breath. We speak on exhalation. You breathe in air, and when you begin to release that air, that's when you begin to speak. When you run out of air, on exhalation, you take in another breath and you then begin to expel that air and you begin to talk again. Now as we progress and we get into, let's say, uh, long conversations, 15% of what we say is on inhalation. 15% of what we say, or what we breathe, is inhalation. 85% is exhalation. Now at rest, you know, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. And the rate is basically the same at rest. It's when I begin to talk. I take a breath in and then I talk until I can't say anymore because I've run out of air and so I have to stop. And then I take in another breath and then I continue to talk. So you can see that the exhalation is much longer than the inhalation. Inhalation is about 15% of that breathing cycle. And exhalation is about 85% of that breathing cycle. We have to have this, these four processes working together, working together. Now we know that this whole process has to take in our muscles and we have control of some of those muscles. If you're slouching in your chair, you have the voluntary control to straighten up. Better posture gives you better air and helps you to produce better speech. Now the vocal folds are responsible, if you remember, for generating the noise of speech. Your phonating, phonating. And the, you have a trachea and you have an esophagus. And they're, one is right in front of the other. They're, they're like this. And <clears throat> the larynx sits on top of that trachea. And it's a valve. It's, it's a working valve. And when something begins to go down the wrong place, down the wrong pipe to end up in your lungs, that valve was open when it should have been closed because the synchrony of the swallow was off. And so it did go down the wrong pipe or started to. And that's why you cough. Your face may turn red. Your eyes may water. 
you uh, may kind of scrunch down. It's your body's way of trying to get rid of that foreign substance that was going down the wrong pipe. So it's important that we don't get foreign substances in our lungs. We don't want um, food in our lungs. We don't want our milk in our lungs. Um, we want to keep those foreign substances out of the way. But it, our body has this way of uh, taking care of itself in some respects, this reflex that blows that substance out. And it's a cough. Now there are some individuals with disabilities that their sensory system doesn't work quite right and their body doesn't know that something's going down the wrong way. And they don't cough. We call them silent aspirators. And it's a, neural, a result of a neurological injury. And they just don't know that, the body doesn't know that that foreign substance is there, so they don't cough. But for you and for me, we would cough. And sometimes it's a violent cough. So that's what we want to have happen. So um, it keeps us from getting sick or ending up with, with aspiration pneumonia. And um, so that's the primary function. The secondary function of the larynx is sound production. Now when we talk about the resonation, the resonating cavity, <coughs> we have three resonating cavities. And I'm going to show you a picture. And hopefully I can use my handy dandy pencil over here and I can point out some of these structures. This is a lateral view, a lateral view of someone's head. And as you can probably tell, and this is kind of backwards, guys, so you're going to see me kind of grope. This is the nasal cavity. Because as you can see here, these are your teeth. This white lump is your tongue. So if you go up, this is your nasal cavity. It's up here. When you have a cold and, and you're sick and you're all stopped up, the nasal cavity may sound, you make your speech sound different because it's all stopped up. That's one of the resonating cavities. The other resonating cavity is the oral cavity here. This is the oral cavity. Oral cavity, nasal cavity here. The third resonating cavity, let me get my bearings here, is in the pharynx. And it's here. It's this back of your throat. Right there, the back of your throat. Okay, those are the three resonating cavities. Now what I want you to think about is I want you to think about um, a bottle. Let's say it's a water bottle and it's empty or it's almost empty. And you take that water bottle and you begin to blow in it. I don't know if I can make it work or not. see if I can do it. I don't know if I can. Did you hear that? Now, it was a higher pitch when there was more water in it. When I, re when I removed some of the water, I can't do it now. Can't do it now. But it did change the second time that I did it. And it, this, um, the opening is a little large. But anyway, so the resonating cavity changes depending on the size. So if you're talking about the oral cavity, if your mouth is open wider, the sound is going to be different than if your 
uh, or if your mouth or your oral cavity is smaller. Your voice will sound different if you're stopped up than if your nasal cavities are clear. The pharyngeal area will <clears throat> resonate that sound and change the sound a little bit depending on the soft palate and if the soft palate goes back. So those are the resonating cavities. The oral cavity, the nasal cavity, and the pharyngeal cavity. Now, it's important, resonation is important for shaping sounds, and it's important particularly for vowels, vowel production. Most vowels are open, and they are produced with just a free flow of speech. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, of air, free flow air. <clears throat> now, the, the, the um, primary vowels are M, M, the sound is coming up high, M, N, and ing, ing. And you can almost feel it resonate up into the nasal cavity. The flow of air when you say S, s is constricted. The oral cavity is constricted. If you say f, you've closed down that oral cavity. Um, on the other page they were talking about puh, puh, and you've widened the oral cavity. You've made it wider so the sound is different in terms of resonation. And when you're saying p, you stop and explode, stop and explode. You do that on P's, t, t. It's constricted and you say it and you explode. E, that constriction is a little tighter. O, O. It's wider and then you constrict it a little bit. Now the pharynx is the third resonating cavity and it's going to connect the trachea and the mouth. And it's a muscular structure and it can adjust and change in many ways during speech. And it happens very quickly, it's very synchronized, it's very smooth and it can change the resonance. And as I just mentioned, the nasal, nasal cavities are open for resonation only for the production of M, M, mm, N, mm, and ing, that I-N-G at the end of words. Now as we talk about the other process, articulation. And this is how we break up the airstream into sounds for speech and usually we're using the oral structures. Now, articulation is primarily concerned with consonant production. Consonant production. Articulation, consonants, vowels, resonation. And the articulators include the teeth because you, when you produce a TH, as in the word Thumb, see where my tongue is? Thumb, thumb, um, this, um, there was another one. Um, I can't think of it now. I was going to say another word. Oh, I'll, and you can put that, that sound at the end of the word. Teeth, beginning, middle, and end. You also have the tongue. We know, we've talked about that. La, la, la. You have the lips, mmm, p, b. The alveolar ridge, remember when I showed you the resonating cavities? The alveolar ridge is, whoa, here we go. It's the area behind the front teeth right here. Behind those front teeth, right there. And you can take the tip of your tongue and run it along the roof of your mouth. 
and it's a little bit bumpy, that's because this underneath that skin is a bone. It's a bony surface. It's a bony structure. And the tongue tip goes up into that area of the alveolar ridge to produce specific sounds. That's the alveolar ridge. Now, we also have as an articulator the hard, that's, then it becomes the hard palate. Past the alveolar ridge, on back a little bit, is the hard palate. Now you get back so far on the roof of your mouth with the hard palate, and there is no more bone. It's just skin. It's just tissue that goes on back. That's called the soft palate or the velum. Now, when you look in your mouth, if you think you're sick and you have white spots, and so you open your mouth, ah, and you look, you see that little appendage that hangs down. Let me draw a picture of it. You look in somebody's mouth, and you see this little appendage hanging up, hanging down. You're looking straight in. This could be the top lip, the nose up here. <laughs> That's when you look in, ah, you see that appendage that hangs down. Before you get to that little appendage, it's the soft palate. If you keep going forward, you get to the bony structure called the hard palate. It's called the hard palate because there's bone under that tissue. The soft palate is just soft because it's just tissue. This is called the uvula. Whoops. That's the uvula that hangs down. The soft palate which is this part here that goes back from the hard palate. And I'm going to put something on canvas for you, is the velum. So you go from the alveolar ridge right behind the teeth, back to the soft palate, then you go back to the hard palate, then you go to the soft palate, and then you go to the uvula. Okay? Those are articulators because they do something when we produce sounds. Now, you also are using the jaw. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You're, and you're using your teeth because your tongue will come in contact with your teeth. Oh, and did I mention the lips? I think I forgot the lips. The lips, because when you produce an F sound, you're using your teeth and your lip. Ba, 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 using your lips. Ma, 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 you're using your lips. So you have your teeth, your tongue, your lips, the alveolar ridge. Then it goes back to the hard palate. Then it goes back to the soft palate. The soft palate is called the velum and the jaw. Those are the articulators. That turns out to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that we're talking about that are instrumental in the production of speech sounds. Not all of those articulators are going to move. Uh, some do, some move more than others, but they all serve a purpose in particular sound production. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about the brain. The brain, the brain, the brain. Okay. I've got two different pictures that I can use to show you the brain. Um, 
this is also a lateral view. Got to put it up so I can see it too. This is a lateral view of the brain. So the front of the brain is in this orangey red area right here. This is called the frontal lobe right here, frontal lobe. It's in the front. On the side is the temporal lobe. Temporal, temporal lobe. Frontal lobe, temporal lobe. Now you have two hemispheres. You have these two sections. And you have the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe. You have in the back is the occipital, oh wait a minute, it's in the green, occipital lobe, and on the top is the parietal lobe. So you have a right hemisphere, for you it would be this one, right hemisphere, left hemisphere, you have two sides, and you have temporal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe is in the back, and the frontal lobe is in the front of these two hemispheres. The cerebrum is the largest portion of the brain. The cerebrum, it doesn't really label it here. It's the largest part of the brain and is incompletely divided into two hemispheres. They're called hemispheres, two sections. Now, <clears throat> these two hemispheres have to communicate with each other in some way. And the way they do that is by use of the corpus callosum. And that is right here on page six in my notes. Corpus callosum. The hemispheres are connected by this band of tissues. And it, and it, um, it uh, allows for a pathway of emotions and information to cross over from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere. All right, corpus callosum, corpus callosum. It's a major communication pathway, especially for emotions. In most people, the left hemisphere is, the, is responsible for speech and language activities, more so than the right. The left hemisphere has greater responsibility for speech and language than the right. Now, in the area of the temporal lobe, we have Wernicke's area. Wernicke, right here. In the area of the temporal lobe, for you it's like this, the left. Um, it is responsible for comprehension and the formulation of language. Comprehension and the formulation of language. Then we have that information sent to Broca's area. Broca's area. And Broca's area is right here. Right here. And Broca's area is located in the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe. Wernicke is in the temporal lobe. It is responsible for comprehension and language formulation. Then it gets moved to the temporal lobe in Broca's area. And language information is transmitted. It's sent from Wernicke to Broca. And the information is organized into appropriate articulatory movements. Motor sequence, motor sequence, motor movements. And when we speak right now, I'm using motor movements, motor movements. So, Wernicke's area, left hemisphere, it's in the frontal lobe. No, I'm sorry, it's located in the temporal lobe. Got him confused. In the temporal lobe, and it's primarily concerned with comprehension and the formulation of language. 
temporal. And then it moves to Broca, it, it, Broca's area, which is in the frontal lobe, and it, that focuses on the sequenced articulatory movements. So if the left hemisphere is more, in, more involved with language, then the right hemisphere is less involved with language. But there is some language that does take place from the, le from the right hemisphere. It's just not primary like it is. In the right hemisphere, there is evidence of melody and rhythm and singing. But the left hemisphere is primarily uh, used for language. Um, I will tell you that damage to Wernicke's area, <clears throat> which is dealing with language function and comprehension, if you have damage in this area, let's say you've had a stroke, and the blood supply to uh, this temporal lobe has been interrupted. The individual would be able to speak, but it wouldn't be very fluent. They would stop and start, and it um, it would lack meaning, and you wouldn't maybe be able to follow what they're saying. Um, and remember, the impact is on comprehension and function. Now, in Broca's area, the responsibility is controlling this motor function, motor function involved with speech production. And somebody who's, who has damage in Broca's area can understand the language, but they can't properly form the words, which makes sense. It's motor. Now, we have 12 pairs, let me check the time, 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And I don't know if you had this. Um, I'll have to see. I can put it on canvas for you. But you have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And these 12 pairs of cranial nerves are on each side from each hemisphere. And there are, so there are 12 pairs, so there are 24. Some of those cranial nerves are in control of motor function. Some of those cranial nerves are in control of sensory function. So what are your senses? When I say senses, what does that mean to you? Well, the five senses are sight, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, it's how we interpret our environment. It's how we interpret the environment that's around us. We all know those kiddos who sensory components, sensory deficits, they can't handle loud noises, they can't handle the chairs sliding on the floor in the classroom, someone who drops a pencil, they can't handle a siren. Uh, they don't like to be touched. They have to smell things. That's sensory. So some of the cranial nerves are motor primarily. Some of them are sensory primarily, and some of them are both. They're what we call mixed. Six of the cranial nerves out of the 12 are concerned with motor speech. So half of them are concerned with the movement and how fluid our movements are to produce speech. You may know someone who's had a stroke. They can't talk very well. Their feet is slow and the tongue maybe just sort of sits there and they can't use it efficiently, and they may drool a little bit because there's weakness around the lips. There's been damage to a cranial nerve. That cranial nerve could be cranial nerve four, 
according to my picture. And I might, tr like I said, I'll try and find this picture and put it on canvas and then I'll make reference to it again for you to look at the numbers and where the numbers are located because that tells you if there's damage in that area what might be going on. If you have a child who uh, had a difficult birth and that child was later diagnosed with cerebral palsy, you may see them kind of lean over in their chair because they have weak muscles and their core strength isn't good and they have trouble holding their head up and it may just kind of flop. If they can get it to go back, you know, it might just flop. They may sit. And if they're sitting with the mouth open and the tongue hanging forward, drooling is inevitable because the strength of these nerves, these cranial nerves, is not good. There has been damage to the cranial nerve. Cranial nerve one, just to give you a little bit of a highlight, this is supposed to be a face, okay? Could be smell. If you see where it's located, right in the center, it could be smell, wouldn't you think? Two could be vision. Three is right above the eyes, eyebrows. Four, upper lip. Five is along uh, the forehead, the side of the face, and it does encompass the mouth somewhat. Six could be the cheeks. Seven, the sides of the head. Eight, hearing. Nine is the back of the tongue. Ten is the middle of the tongue. Eleven could be the jaws down in here, whoops, here, and twelve would be the tip of the tongue. So if you had damage to cranial nerves 9, 10, and 12, you may not be able to move your tongue very well. That's what that means. If you had, um, the one that's important to me, and in some cases to you, would be the eighth auditory nerve. Um, it's this one right here. It's your ear, the ear. Eighth, it's number eight, eighth auditory nerve. That question usually appears on an exam. What is important about the eighth auditory nerve? Well, auditory is your cue, it's hearing, hearing. So. Just think about it, 24 cranial nerves keep all of this going, 24. Now, we're going to start talking about the ear and hearing. And I'm also going to put a picture of the ear. It should be this picture on canvas. Now, see the word that's at the top of, uh, directly above the ear. Not that word outer ear, that's way up there. Cerumen. C-E-R-U-M-E-N. Cerumen. I thought it was A-N. <laughs> now that I look at that, it doesn't look right. I'll check it. Cerumen. But anyway, um, this is the ear. Now, I'm going to put that picture on canvas for you, but if you think about hearing, and most of you, when you wrote down uh, how you thought children learned language and uh, why it was important, you talked about communicating with other people, um, helping us learn, uh, learning other languages, uh, you talked somewhat about cultural diversity, 
um, you've got to be able to hear language to learn it. And if you have a significant hearing loss, you're going to have a, a significant language delay. Now, a factor that is important in considering how much of a delay you have is the age at which you have that delay. You uh, acquire a hearing loss, a significant hearing loss. If you're six months old and you have a significant hearing loss, you're going to have a significant language delay, very significant. If you're, and it also depends on the course of treatment, the rehabilitation, what types of adaptive equipment you might be given. Do you have a cochlear implant? Do you have a hearing aid? And so the course of treatment makes the difference too as to the development of language. If you're my age and you acquire a significant hearing loss, my language probably won't be very delayed because I've had 65 years, well, 64, let's take off a year, of learning language, hearing it, writing it, speaking it. And so my language is very well ingrained. It is a part of who I am. I don't, did not, did not have a language problem in school. So the language skills are in place. However, a six month old who acquires a significant language delay is, uh, or a significant hearing loss could very easily end up with a significant language delay. Now what I will tell you is, uh, when I was working first steps, I went into a home, I, there was a referral, and I went into the home, and the little guy was not quite a year old, and he was on the list to get a cochlear implant, and they were bypassing the cochlea and going directly to the nerve to stimulate for hearing. And they first had to put hearing aids on him to see if there was going to be, excuse me, any benefit from the hearing aids. Just getting a little dry, sorry. He was Medicaid and they want to make sure that there isn't enough benefit from hearing aids because cochlear implants are quite a bit more expensive. And so they, these are just the, the hoops that you have to jump through. So <clears throat> hearing aids made no difference. So he was a candidate from Dr. Miyamoto. He and his son are in Indianapolis. One of them may be at Riley and one of them may be at St. Vincent's at Peyton Manning's hospital, but they were going to put cochlear implant in. They think that this little guy had some residual hearing, had a little hearing and then lost it, but he wasn't hearing. So I was there trying to do some language stimulation with vibration, uh, letting him feel the refrigerator if it kicked on maybe turning on a toy that vibrated, feeling things, and uh, associating how something felt, maybe with a facial expression. Uh, anything I could think of to associate hearing with an object. So he got his first cochlear implant and we continued with our treatment, we were working on sounds, and I was working on uh, things such as a cow goes moo, and I was very expressive, moo, and I even might even have him touch me, moo, and feel the vibration, moo, okay? 
and then a siren, and I'd, I'd have a, a picture, or I'd have an actual uh, fire truck or siren, and I would try and give him some expression with my face, and he he was beginning to make sounds, but ooh, they weren't very speech-like at all. They were more screeches, um, just sound. And um, so speech, it was it was a struggle. I I guess I would have to say. Well, mom had another baby, another boy, and. They're only about a year apart, 18 months maybe. And um, I was concerned about the second child. So I asked mom if the child, the second boy, had passed the newborn hearing screening. And she's, because that's something that they do at the hospital. Every newborn is to have a newborn hearing screening so that they can catch hearing loss early. Well, she said, you know, they, they weren't sure. They thought it was okay. Um, the instrument wasn't working very well. So they sent her to Riley. And they weren't sure. They thought it was okay. So I thought, okay. And she was the parent. She's the parent, not me. She is. And so, um, I said, well, the next time you go to the doctor, why don't you talk to the doctor about it and see if the doctor won't make a, another referral for a hearing test. I said, you know, I just would feel better. Oh, he hears okay. He imitates what his brother says. Yeah, because when I was in the home to see the first child, the, uh, the second one was always there. So I was always doing things with him too. And he produced the same screeching non-speech sounds that his older brother did and I'm going Ooh. so the oldest boy and I never picked up the younger child in first steps it was just the older one but the younger one was always around the older boy aged out of first steps the parents took him back to Riley they had initially recommended two cochlear implants but they weren't interested in two they just wanted the one Riley told him, this little boy needs to learn language, and he's behind, way behind. And if you don't do something soon, you're going to miss this window of opportunity. Well, I was working here at Ball State, so Mom immediately called me. We got him into therapy. He got his second cochlear implant, and his speech is coming along. It's much better. The younger brother, they brought him in. They wanted to test him in, for speech and language because he wasn't talking much. They took him into one of the therapy rooms and somebody accidentally shut the door. He did not move. He now has bilateral cochlear implants. And I'm thinking, mm, this is a genetic thing, I think. Mom's pregnant again. And I'm thinking, oh, no, please, not a boy. Because I was afraid there would be a third one who couldn't hear. That it was somewhere in that genetic makeup between mom and dad that was causing this. Mom had a girl, and she's fine. She's fine. So, learning language was a struggle. But without, and without the cochlear implants, they would have probably been life signers. Uh, but they got the cochlear implants. And not that they don't miss things from time to time, but um, I no longer sign to them when I see them upon occasion. And um, the language is coming along. Without that amplification, they would not have blossomed like they did. You've got to hear it to be able to learn it. And that's a fact. Okay, I think I'll stop there. I will put on Canvas if, I, I'm pretty sure I have the ear, and then we'll talk more about the structures. 
and then the cranial nerves. I'll see if I have that one too, and I'll put that on. This lecture is chapter 10. The first one, the first video recording that's on there should be chapter 10, one, uh, 10A. This is chapter 10, 10B, because this is the second section, um, or the second lecture, okay? All right, remember to turn in that assignment, how do children learn language, uh, how does language help us, and so don't forget to do that. All right, you know how to get a hold of me if you have questions or concerns. Some of you have, uh, I will be contacting to find out if you have a, pa a Mac or a PC because when we do the first exam, well, all exams, you will need to have a, a Mac or a PC so that you can tap into Respondus Monitor in order to take that exam. So you might have to borrow uh, a computer from somebody if you have a Chrome or something. Not very many people have Chrome. Um, most of you have a Mac or a PC, but in order to take that exam, you will need a Mac or a PC. All right, we are going to stop this recording and I'll do the next one, uh, 10C, in the next couple days. See ya.